individuals from the Old Testament and showing how they point us toward Jesus and how Jesus is awesome, he's greater, he's true and better than what these Old Testament characters were. And this morning we are looking at a man who, in all honesty, we could probably spend an entire year studying his life. And so I am going to try to do a task of share the story of Abraham with you in about 30 minutes. And so um, and so you're going to hear bits and pieces of his life all combined together. But what I want to do is more than just talk about Abraham, I want to show how Jesus was the true and better Abraham. Where Abraham failed, Jesus was perfect. Where Abraham disobeyed, Jesus was obedient. And so in our study today, I want you to see how amazing Abraham was and how he is one of the, he is the father of our faith, but even in his flawness, he pointed us toward one who was true and better. And so that's what we're going to look at. I want to begin with a story that I think I shared probably last year at Advent. Actually, before I begin, let me read the text. Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Genesis 12, 1 through 4. It says, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will, and him who dishonors you I will curse. In you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went, and the, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. I want to begin by sharing a story I believe I shared during our Advent series. It's a story that's found in a book called The Necklace. The necklace is a story about a woman by the name of Madame Lozelle. She was a woman who should have been born with riches, should have been born for better things, but fate and circumstances caused her to be in one of the lower castes of society. And growing up, she had romantic notions that one day she would marry a gentleman of great wealth and distinction, but after a while, she settled to marry a clerk in the Ministry of Education. Madame Lozelle suffered endlessly. She hated her little apartment with its faded wallpaper and its worn chairs and its dingy curtains. She had no fine clothes. She had no jewelry. She had nothing. These were the only things that she really loved in life. These were the only things that she really wanted in life. One evening, her husband came home from work with an envelope, a manila envelope, and she tore it open, and there was an engraved card in there, an invitation to a ball that was being hosted by the Ministry of Education. Mademoiselle read the card. She resentfully tossed it aside, and she pouted. Her husband was surprised. She thought He thought that she would be excited to go to a ball, and she said, He's like, I thought you would be pleased by this. And she goes, what am I going to wear? You husbands know that feeling, right? Um, what am I going to wear? And her husband cautiously asked, what would it cause, what would it cost to get a nice dress? And she calculated in her mind quickly and she said, at least 400 francs. And her husband gasped and was like, 400 francs? Um, and he realized that he had 400 francs saved up to buy a hunting gun. And he said, I'll give you the 400 francs. Let's go to the dinner. But try to buy a dress that, will, that you can use more than just once. And so Mademoiselle went, buys this dress. And days pass, and he comes home one day, and she's still pouted. She's upset. She's restless. And the husband goes, why are you still upset? You got the dress that you wanted. And she goes, but I have no jewelry for this dress. There's nothing more humiliating than looking poor in the presence of other women. And her husband was now frustrated and goes, you're a silly woman. Why don't you go to your friend, Madame Forestier, who is your childhood friend, who's well off, and why don't you borrow some of her jewelry? And then you can look nice for the ball. The next day, the elegant lady, high, elegant high lady of society, Madame Forestier, received Madame Lozelle into her home. She was most happy to loan jewelry to her childhood friend. She opened a box full of glittering trinkets, and Mademoiselle tried all of them on, but none of them satisfied her. 
And then she saw a gorgeous diamond necklace. Her heart began to beat covetously. And she put it on her neck. It, it was perfect. She loved it. It was breathtakingly beautiful. And she cautiously asked, could I borrow this one just for one night? And without even blinking an eye, Madame Forrester said, of course. Anything you want in here, you can borrow. Mademoiselle flung herself around her friend and left that house with the treasure in hand, incredibly grateful. The party was a roaring success. She was the most beautiful woman at the ball, radiant in her new dress, stunning, and with her stunning necklace. All the men stared at her. They were inquiring her name and asking to be introduced to her. She danced with ecstasy, the bell of the ball, intoxicated by success she had dreamed of all of her miserable life. But the night ended. Cinderella had to go back home. She had to go back to her dirty walls and her dingy curtains. And wanting desperately to hold on to her fading glory for just a few more seconds, she took one last look at her cracked mirror in the bedroom and she let out a shriek of anguish. The necklace was gone. And in a panic, her husband retraced their steps looking for the necklace, but their search was fruitless. The necklace was lost, their lives were ruined. They frantically made their rounds around the jewelry stores, finally finding a necklace that looked exactly like the one that they lost. The pawn shop owner told them it was 40,000 francs. But you could have it for 34,000, he said. The family pawned everything that they owned. They borrowed the rest at a high interest rate and Mademoiselle took the new necklace to Madame Forrester and without even looking at the necklace, the lady said in a chilling voice, well, you could have at least brought it back a few days earlier. And life began to spiral downward, downward for the Luzel family. The husband had to work extra jobs. He, she had to take in laundry and do housekeeping. 10 years and she now has become an old woman. Graying, her graying hair badly done, her skirts tattered and her hands raw and red. She spoke with a shrill voice born of bitterness. For there'd be days when she would sit by her window and her mind would go back to the day where she was the belle of the ball. And there was one Sunday afternoon when she was taking a stroll down the street where she saw her old friend, Madame Forcier. Her young friend was still young and beautiful and overcome by emotion, Madame Luzel said, good morning, Jeannie. And the lady was surprised that the shabby woman would speak to her with such familiarity. Madame Luzel says, don't you recognize me? I'm Matilda, I'm your childhood friend. And Madame Forster was shaken and she said, Matilda, what happened to you? And 10 years of anguish gushed out as Madame Luzel told the story about her ruin because of the necklace. And as she was finishing, a look of horror crossed Madame Forster's face. And she said, oh, my poor Matilda, my poor Matilda, the diamonds I loaned you, they were imitations. At best, they would have cost 400 francs. I share this story from the necklace because it's a good story. It's a story that you should read. It's a story that you should read to your children. It warns us of a common tragedy. It spells out a life principle that we learn from the life of Abraham. And in fact, the life of Jesus where we learn that as followers of Jesus, we should not settle for lesser things. We should not settle in life for the lesser things of life. See, like Madame Lazelle, so many of us spend our lives on lesser things. Life is too precious for that. Nothing is more tragic than Christians who are offered a taste of heaven when we're content with the t table scraps of this earth. C.S. Lewis would put it this way. He said, so many are like the ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it means to be offered a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased for lesser things. Abraham, our character this morning, wasn't put on this earth for lesser things. A few years ago, Time Magazine had Abraham on the cover of their magazine declaring him 
to be the man of the last 4,000 years, the father of three great religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the spiritual ancestor to 54% of the world's population or 4 billion people say that Abraham is the father of their faith. The decisions that he made in his life have both blessed and cursed our world. He is the father of our faith, but he is also an incredibly flawed man. He made some horrible decisions in his life, but as we'll see this morning, Abraham in his life points to someone that was true and someone that was better than him, one who was what that old man could never be, one who we would call our savior. And from the life of Abraham, I want to give you three lessons this morning for you to apply to your life, three things from the life of Abraham. Number one, Abraham was willing to leave the safe things for the better things. Abraham was willing to leave the safe things for the better things. Genesis 12 verse 1 begins like this. It says, God said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Let me be honest, it wasn't easy for Abraham to go. He had followed his father out of Ur. Ur at that time was the greatest city on the earth. The wealth of the ancient world poured into that city on the Persian Gulf. The kings of Mesopotamia were buried there. Schools and libraries made it the intellectual center of Asia. Some 2,000 years before Christ, the city of Ur had air-conditioned shopping malls, sewer systems, and an indoor plumbing all in that city. Abraham's father was an idol worshiper. And yet there was a restlessness in Terah that drove him out into the desert, leaving the safety and security of Ur. Maybe Terah was feeling what C.S. Lewis would describe in mere Christianity, that if I find myself a desire that no experience in this world could satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was created for something more than this, that I was made for another world. See, God wanted Terah to go to Canaan, the high desert country of what is now Israel. But Terah decided to settle for lesser things by going to a city called Haran. It wasn't Ur, but it was not a, not, not a bad place to settle at all. It was straddled between the borders of what is now Turkey and Syria. It was a major trading center for the upper Middle East. A man could get rich quick in the city of Haran. But getting rich is one of those lesser things in life. And so God caused Abraham to go where his father Terah would not go. And it wasn't easy. Notice three things from our text. Number one, Abraham was 75 years old. It wasn't an easy age to pull up roots. He had to leave his country and family for a life of loneliness. He had to leave his father's household. That word household means stability. It means familiarity. It means security. He leaves all of that. He trades a house for a tent. Like homeless people, pulling along their belongings in a shopping cart and living in makeshift cardboard shanties, Abraham goes from unknown to unknown for the rest of his life. You think about the words of Jesus when he says, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Look at verse 4. It says, Abraham went, Abram went where the Lord directed him. The key phrase there, he went where the Lord directed him. He left everything to follow God. He had no idea where this road would go. He would dwell among strangers in a foreign land as an immigrant, sometimes even as an unwanted immigrant. There would be times when Abraham, Sarah, and Lot would cross over into a place where they weren't welcome or wanted. You think about the words of Jesus to his followers in Matthew 16. If anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his cross and follow me. See, a person who picks up a cross in Jesus' day he didn't wear that cross on his back as a piece of jewelry. He was basically saying, I'm ready to die. I'm going to my execution. And he never went home again. He said goodbye to his family. He get, said goodbye to his things. And he left the safe place for a dreadful thing. You know, following Jesus is not a call to convenience, to comfort, to safety. Sometimes following Jesus will take you to places where you wish you didn't have to go. It will cause you to do things where you wish you didn't have to do those things. But following Jesus is never about being safe or successful 
or blessed. It was about being obedient regardless of what life brings to you. Abraham chose not to settle for the lesser things. Terah, his father, dies in the city of Haran without ever tasting the promised land. So he he played it safe his entire life like so many of us do with our lives. See, but there was one thing that led Abraham to leave the safe thing. He knew there was something better. He knew that there was something better. See, tucked between verse 1 and verse 4 is this incredible promise that God makes to Abraham and his family. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing, Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I'll take care of that as well. All the peoples of this earth will be blessed through you. See, through this man, Abraham, God was going to change the world. A childless old man with a barren old wife was going to become a nation that would bless the nations. But that required a miracle. That means he would have to have a son. He was already 75 years old. And you know what God does? God makes him wait 25 more years. Abraham has to wait till the age of 100. His wife, Sarah, is now 90. Can you imagine waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled in your life for 25 years? And yet that is what Abraham does. He lived a life of faith. And at the age of 100, his wife Sarah gives birth to a baby by the name of Isaac. And you know, along the way, Abraham wasn't perfect. There were times when he would get angry with God. There were times when he would resort to his own schemes and devices. And the results of that have been disastrous even to this day. Abraham was a man of monumental faith. But he was a flawed man. He was a man who made major mistakes in his life. You know, but there was one moment in Abraham's life of unforgettable faith. There was a day when God came and spoke to Abraham, and he said, Abraham, I've given you this precious child. This is the promised child. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that child, and I want you to go to the top of the mountain, and I want you to sacrifice that child. And you know, you read that scripture, There is no argument from Abraham. He obeys in a heartbeat. He doesn't question. He doesn't resist. The writer of Hebrews says, By faith Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice because he reasoned that God could raise even the dead. See, Abraham on that day, he didn't play it safe. He knew that if God said something, God was faithful to do it. See, why was he willing to forsake the comforts of the city of Ur and the prophets of the city of Haran to become a desert nomad, unwanted and unwelcome? Hebrews 11 would say it this way. In verse 10 of Hebrews 11, it says, he was looking forward to a better city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. The city that Abraham was looking forward to makes Ur and makes Haran look like a cheap imitation diamond necklace. What is the city? St. Augustine calls it the city of God. Our Savior Jesus calls it the church. St. Paul calls it the living temple. Human stones made up of Jesus followers standing on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. St. John will call it the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven like a bride. It is a mega metropolis big enough to hold men and women boys and girls from every tribe and every nation and every people group from every generation. It is the city of God. It is the church of God. See, Abraham couldn't build the city which is the glorious church of God and neither can we. But someone true and better could, someone true and better can, and someone true and better will. Our second point this morning is Abraham 
a better Abraham, we achieve even better things. There is so much that we can admire in the life of Abraham. The Bible spares nothing on praising the faith of Abraham. But the scriptures will not allow us to memorialize this man or any other man or women in scriptures. Abraham points to a far and greater and truer person. In Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul would say that the great son that God promised Abraham was Jesus. Abraham was a shadow pointing to someone better. Abraham was a shadow. When you see a shadow, you don't get caught up in the shadow, but you look around to find out what that shadow is, what that reflection is of. Abraham was simply pointing to Jesus. See, like Abraham, Jesus would leave his father's house and the comforts of his home to a place where he was unwanted, to a place where he was unwelcome. For 33 years of his life, God's son would live in the ragged tent of a human flesh, battered and buffeted by the desert winds of affliction. He went into the great unknown because his father in heaven commanded him to do so. He too had to rely on faith over and over again when nothing seemed to be happening in the world around him. He too had to drink the cup of disappointment over and over when people would abandon him. Like Abraham, he too looked forward to that city not made with human hands. He looked forward to the church. He became the true and better Isaac when he was sacrificed on a lonely hill. See, but unlike Isaac, there was no ram to take his place. His father drove the knife of heaven into him, not once, but over and over and over again. He was consumed on the altar by the fires of hell. But Abraham was right about one thing. God did raise his son from the dead to fulfill his covenant promises that the whole world would be blessed through the son of Abraham. But there are incredible differences between Abraham and Jesus. Abraham got to be a part of his family for a while. It was him, Sarah, and Lot, the human trinity. But it was completely different for Jesus. See, the second person of the Trinity went alone across the galaxies to the solitary darkness of a virgin's womb. Jesus was always obedient. Abraham was shaky at best. Days where he was good and days when he tried to do things his own way. See, we still suffer from Abraham's lapse of faith. We look at the Middle East and we look at all the stuff that we're talking about now. Millions slaughtered in holy wars down through the millennia as the three sons of Abraham fight this never-ending family feud. Abraham couldn't wait on God, so he slept with his wife's servant, Egyptian servant, and they had a baby. They named this baby Ishmael. But God had another miracle baby in mind by the name of Isaac. Ishmael became the father of the Arabs, and out of Arabia became his descendant Muhammad. To this day, Islam claims the promises of God's covenant with Abraham because Ishmael is the firstborn son of Abraham. Isaac was the father of the Jews. To this day, Orthodox Jews claim ownership of the promised land because of their bloodline to Isaac. But Isaac had a descendant by the name of Jesus, the third son of Abraham. And during the Middle Ages, great armies of the Crusaders would go into the Middle, Middle East and turn it into a bloodbath, claiming that Christianity possessed the Middle East. The children of the three sons of Abraham have turned the promised land into a killing field. What an awful thing to settle for lesser things when God tells you he's got greater things in store for you. You know, the woman that Abraham slept with, Hagar, never would have even showed up if it wasn't for another lapse in Abraham's faith. There was a time when Abraham was going through Egypt, and he was scared because his wife Sarah was so beautiful that they would kill Abraham and take his wife. And so Abraham told his wife, hey, just tell everyone you're my sister. 
He was willing to give up his wife just to spare his own life. But God, in his grace, sends a plague to the Egyptians, and they find out that Sarah is actually Abraham's wife, and they send Abraham and Sarah off. And when they send them off, they give them all sorts of gifts and riches to take with them, all sorts of plunder. Along with that was this woman by the name of Hagar. Hagar would have never came on the scene if Abraham trusted that God would take care of him in the first place and they left alive. One mistake after another mistake because Abraham didn't trust God enough to take care of him. See, but this is what I love about the true and better Abraham. The flawed Abraham, he gave up his bride to save his life. The true and better Abraham gave up his life so that the bride could be saved. He was willing to lay down his own life for the bride of Christ. One more thing I want you to notice. This true and better Abraham, the better person, he gives us the best things. Listen to the words of Hebrews 11, verse 10. It says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus once and for all. Listen to these ironies in this story. Abraham was blessed despite of his disobedience. But Jesus was obedient all the way. He never disobeyed. And instead of being blessed, Jesus was actually cursed. Abraham couldn't even save his own sons. Isaac walks with God, sort of. Abraham, um, Ishmael forsakes God. His nephew Lot compromises his faith. Abraham prays for Sodom, but he cannot bring about his salvation. His grandson Esau trades his birthright for a pot of stew. His great-grandsons, the 12 sons of Jacob, are screwed-up kids. They're all scoundrels. And to this day, the natural descendants of Isaac are blinded to the great son of Abraham, Jesus, whom they reject. On the one hand, his partial obedience gave birth to a savior 2,000 years later. But on the other hand, his disobedience has turned the world into a place of terror 4,000 years later. See, but the true and better Abraham died on a cross to redeem the world, to produce a nation, a spiritual nation that would bless every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Abraham is dead. He's buried somewhere. But the resurrected, true and better Abraham still moves across the world in power, and he's still transforming lives even to this day. He transforms Ishmael's. He transforms Esau's. He transforms scoundrel sons of Jacob. He saves cities like Sodom and Gomorrah, and he has redeemed you and me where we are now the children of Almighty God. He's still moving. He's still working. He is the architect and the builder of the city that Abraham could only see from a distance. His is a better promise. His is a better nation. His is a better inheritance. This morning, as we close, i got to ask you, do you know this true and better Abraham? See, there is a true and better place than Ur or Haran or Dallas or your job or your safety or your security or your bank account it is a city of God not made with human hands and I encourage you give yourself to that give yourself to that there is a true and better father than Tara he is your heavenly father he hears you when you call give yourself to him because he loves you and he cares for you, and he's willing to lay down the life of his son for you. There is a true and better promise in a piece of land that God gave to Abraham. It is the salvation of the world promised by Jesus. Give yourself to that. There is a true and better spouse than Sarah. It is the bride of Christ, the church, people from every tribe, every nation, united by the fact that we serve a great God who sent his son and spoiled his blood so that we can call each other brothers and sisters. And we're the bride of Christ. 
their true and better sons into sons and daughters of Abraham. We are the spirit-filled children of God that you worship with and live with and call on Jesus with. There's a true and better Abraham. His name is Jesus. And he alone is worthy of our lives, of our worship, of all that we have. Abraham is a man that encourages me. Because I see myself in Abraham. I want to love God. I want to serve God. But I just impatient sometimes. Sometimes I just want to do things my own way. And sometimes I screw things up in ways that I can't imagine. But the grace of God says, in spite of my flaws, despite my weakness, there is a true and better Abraham that would lay down his life for me. And my salvation is not based on what I did or how I did it or how I performed, but it's based on the fact that before I was formed in the womb of my mother's belly, he knew me and he loved me. That I belong to him. This morning when we come to celebrate the communion table, can I encourage you that this is a reminder of how much he loves you, how much he values you. Don't settle for lesser things. Don't settle for things that will take you nowhere in life. Don't settle for cheap imitation diamond necklaces. What you have been given in Jesus is worth far more than all the rubies and gold in this world. Don't settle simply for being successful. Don't settle simply for a nice house and your 2.5 kids and your three cars or whatever else you're dreaming about. You've been made for something so much bigger. You've been created and you've been loved and you've been called by the King of Kings. You are a son and a daughter of God. He is your king. He is also your father. Listen, I will do whatever I need to do to take care of my kids. And if that is true of me, your heavenly father will do whatever he needs to do. You know what proof? That table is proof. That blood that was spilled for you, that body that was broken for you, which we symbolize by a piece of bread and some juice, is proof that your Father will do whatever needs to be done to bring you back home. So when you come to the table this morning, I invite you to come with worship, recognizing that you serve a good, good God who loves you more than you can imagine, and can I suggest more than you deserve. So when you come this morning, come and worship him. The way that we do communion here at Lost City is that the worship team will sing here in a moment, and we're going to just let you spend some time before God, just meditate on the words, let the Holy Spirit deal with you. If there are areas in your life that you need repent, to repent, would you repent this morning? Would you just spend some time with God? And whenever you are ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements from the table and go back to your seats. And I'll come up here in a few moments. We'll partake of the table together. Let's worship. Mm -hmm.